Hello, my name is Jim Horman. I'm with Horman Soil Health Services, and today we're going to talk a little bit about bowl control. Uh, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, you can uh, contact me um, on my cell phone, 419-421-7255, or you can get a hold of me by email at uh, Horman Soil Health Services at gmail.com. If you want more information about bowls, I, I do have about five different fact sheets that I've written uh, in the last couple of years on bowls. And you can go to my website at hormonsoilhealth.com and download those for free. So let's talk a little bit more about these bowls. So bowls are really just field mice. They're about three to seven inches long. They have small ears, small eyes, very short legs and short tail, and they're, they're kind of this brownish grayish fur. And uh, the one that we see the most common is uh, either the metal bowl or the prairie bowl. Uh, as you can see uh, by these graphics, uh, they're pretty common in North America. The metal bowl is, is very widespread throughout North America. The prairie bowl is a little bit more in the Midwest. We don't worry too much about the woodland bowl. There's over 60 species of bowls, uh, but uh, these are the two that cause the most uh, agronomic uh, damage in, in our field crops. Just a little information about what kind of habitat and lifespan. Uh, the meadow bowl uh, really likes the heavy cover, uh, usually low-lying areas that are a little bit wetter. The reason for that is uh, it has to have standing water in order to, uh, uh, to drink. Uh, and it likes cool season and native warm season grasses. The prairie bull uh, can tolerate a little bit sparser cover. Uh, it tends to hang out around fallow fields, fence rows, open, and it can tolerate dry areas because it can get enough moisture out of the vegetation. It really loves alfalfa and red clover. Uh, that's some of its uh, favorite foods. All these voles live anywhere from two up to 24 months. Uh, the metal bowl, not, maybe not quite as long, uh, simply because uh, the prairie bowl has a mate. Uh, they have one gene that's different. And usually when you see one prairie bowl, if you see two of them running together, those are prairie bowls because they're highly attached to each other, okay? Uh, they, they do not hibernate. Uh, they live year round. Uh, and so uh, in the wintertime, uh, uh, they have to consume about 40% more vegetation in order to survive the cold weather. weather. Uh, home range, uh, it kind of varies. Uh, they'll, they'll travel anywhere from 10 to 15 feet out of their burrow. Uh, could be up to you know a quarter of an acre. Sometimes you'll see four or five of these colonies kind of together and they may cover uh, over an acre and a half. What do they eat? Mainly seeds or mainly vegetarian, sometimes a few roots or barks or fruit. Uh, very seldom insects, uh, and sometimes they can cause a little bit of problem to our field tile. Uh, the key thing about these uh, bowls is they're eaten by just about everything. We call them a keystone mammal. They represent almost 40% of all the mammals on the land, and uh, they are a, a major food source for uh, all the major predators, and they, they are very widely distributed. One unique characteristic about the prairie bull, they may have a yellow belly, but other than that, you really can't tell them apart. Uh, like, as we talked about the lifespan, what about the offspring? Uh, metal bowls uh, mate with just about anything or anybody. They mate all the time. They have four to eight litters and up to 11 young per litter, whereas the prairie bowl is more specific. Uh, they're gonna find a mate. Generally, they mate for life. Lower offspring, maybe two to four litters per year, up to seven young per litter, and they hang on to them a little bit longer. But as you look here, uh, their gestation period's very short, uh, 20 to 23 days. Uh, they wean their pups within 12 to 14 days. And 21 days later on the meadow bowl, they can be breeding. And on the prairie bowl, 35 to 40 days. So they can have a lot of young. One meadow bowl can have up to maybe 50 plus young and even her young are starting to have young. And then uh, the prairie bowls, not quite as many, 20 to 30. Uh, so. Uh, it'd be better to have prairie bulls, but uh, maybe they're just a little smarter. I don't know. They stick around a little longer. Uh, meadow bulls. Uh, here's what their burrows. They tend to have their young either in the burrows or on top of the of the ground, and and they make their nest out of grasses, sedges, and weeds. 
Uh, the winter snow does provide cover. Uh, usually they'll have one to two inch shallow runways that extend out from the nest uh, so that they can search for food. And those areas will almost be barren. Uh, and then they have a common area where they deposit their feces. Usually that will be green because of all the nutrients there. And they use that to kind of hide from some of the predators. Voles are mainly active at night during the summer. Uh, uh, and then in the daytime, uh, they're active during the winter time. So, so you don't see them too often. They do have to feed every about four to six hours. If you wanna to try to control them, we'll talk about that a little bit later. The best time to try to catch them uh, would be uh, uh, with, a, with a tool to maybe eliminate a few of them would be right after sun's uh, rise or right before sunset. Uh, that seems to be one of the most active times for them. Just to give you an idea how many meadow voles you might have in a field, um, typically we, on average, you might have 15 to 45 per acre. When they're really thick, they can get up to 600 per acre. They really love the alfalfa fields, um, the bluegrass fields, tall prairie. You can see some of the numbers there. Again, mortality rates are very high with the metal bowls, greater than 80%. Um, typically, they only wean about 2.6 uh, pups uh, per litter. So when do they start to cause damage? Well, uh, when we start to get more than four to five colonies that are in pretty close proximity. And again, uh, the area that they travel can be anywhere 15 feet up to a, a quarter of an acre. When food runs out, they just migrate. And uh, they, they've been known to migrate at least a mile, sometimes as far as two miles, and they're very good swimmers. So uh, they will cross ditches and even ponds. Uh, when you want to scout for bulls is about uh, uh, 30 days uh, before you plant and at least 21 to uh, 28 days after planting because that's when they do most of their damage. And they can reach up about six to 10 inches. And a lot of times we'll see this on the soybeans. They just love soybeans and uh, they will uh, clip off the leaves and uh, because that's really nutritious. If you want to know if you've got an active uh, burrow, just look for fresh clippings or droppings by a slick open hole. That indicates it's active. A lot of times in the summer, though, they'll, they'll migrate out and then they may come back later at harvest uh, when, the, when the pods start to open up and, and they can catch some uh, soybeans. This is where they live uh, during the, when they're not in your field. Uh, they live anywhere where there's permanent um, vegetative cover. Uh, uh, fence lines, wooded areas, uh, pastures, uh, long road ditches. Uh, this is where you're going to find them. They'll hang out in these areas and then uh, they'll migrate uh, into your fields. And it's not only no-till and cover crop fields, they also live in uh, conventional tilled fields. So you, you got to keep an eye out. Here's what they, uh, they like to eat. Uh, one of their most uh, popular foods are red clover and alfalfa. Uh, those are the things they really like, but they also like dandelions and orchard grass and tall fescue, giant ragweed, uh, curly dock, all these, anything that uh, gives a seed, uh, they're, they're uh, going to eat. Uh, cover crops that they like the best would be your cereal, rye, oats, barley, and wheat, uh, but they really, really love the soybean seed. So they'll dig for a soybean seed and uh, they'll also uh, uh, dig them up and and uh, uh, go after the cotton leaves. So that's part of the uh, issue with in soybeans. They can wipe out a soybean field. For some reason, there is a little bit of literature that says they do not like uh, crimson clover. Uh, once in a while, they may eat an insect, uh, but most of the time they're just vegetarian. Uh, and they do uh, store food. Uh, they eat some stored seeds and grain. That's mainly what uh, they're going to eat. This just shows a couple of the uh, holes, what the tunnels look like. Uh, so if you're walking out in the field and you see this, uh, those aren't crawdad holes, those are our bowls. Uh, and uh, uh, you've probably got quite a few of them. Uh, a lot of times the burrows are located under some of these fast growing circles. This is where they're depositing in their feces. And uh, sometimes they can hide there if a predator's coming. This is a field in Wood County uh, just a couple years ago. Uh, this guy had a 60 acre field that was just uh, had tons of bowls in it, didn't have any local, uh, any fence lines or any den trees for the birds to come in there to perch. 
and uh, he got eight bushel per acre that he harvested off this field. So uh, again, we don't really have a threshold for bulls, but once you see more than five colonies uh, in, a, in a small area, uh, you, you probably have a, a, a concern. Again, they represent almost 40% of all the mammals. And uh, usually if they got plenty of food, they don't go very far. If there's not as much food, then they may uh, cover a little bit larger acres. Uh, most of the time, the juveniles only stay with the adults uh, for a short period of time if the food quality is high. Otherwise, uh, uh, the female will, will boot them out and they have to go forage for themselves. But food's good, everybody's partying. I guess they're having a good time. Uh, reduce food sources, uh, that's one of the ways to control these voles. A couple things we can do is grasses and clovers seem to be the most attractive. You can rotate your mixes and uh, you really don't wanna broadcast your seed, try to drill it in, select a cover crop mix that has maybe a, uh, a species that will winter kill. At least 50% of that mixture should uh, winter kill. Oats is a good good one or radish, uh, put, put something like that in. You might try putting some crimson clover in, at least one or two literature sources have said that they don't like crimson clover. I'm not sure how, how valid that is, but uh, you know, you can at least try it. And again, drilling is, is by far the best. What Purdue has found, most of this research was done in uh, the 1990s. The two most effective bowl control measures were to either terminate your cover crop at least 30 days before planting, and then uh, a minimum of 21 to, to 28 days, just because uh, if, you, if you terminate that, then they're probably gonna migrate out. Uh, or mowing, and you can mow your cover down less than eight inches, and that will allow the predators to get in. The other thing you might want to do is keep your field borders uh, mowed uh, and close as well. Now, if you're in a government program, you might want to check with your conservation planning because mowing may affect some of your other resource concerns for wildlife, rabbits, quail, and some of your practice requirements. So if you do have a contract, check, check with NRCS before you do that. There are a lot of predators to voles, snakes, fox, owls, and uh, coyotes are some of the biggest uh, uh, predators to these voles. Here's a whole list of, of different predators, anything from gulls, the blue jays, crows, uh, skunks, possums, raccoons, uh, even turtles, and even uh, fish, because when they swim, uh, you know, largemouth bass and trout will, will eat them. So, uh, they are a major food source for a lot of different predators, and that's why there's, there's so many of them. These are the ones you want to look for and try to promote. The red-tailed hawk uh, stays in Ohio year-round. It has this red tail. We have a couple that come in, though, and migrate. may only be here during the winter months, and that would be the rough-legged uh, hawk, and this is what it looks like. Uh, here's a, a hawk, and uh, I took this from uh, kind of the SNL uh, series uh, with Mr. Bill. Oh no, I just lost my head. Um, I guess I'm not going to shed a tear because we have plenty of them around there and I guess these hawks have to eat also. So uh, yeah, uh, kestrels are probably one of the best uh, uh, birds that we have, uh, birds of prey. This is the American falcon. Uh, it's native to our area. They stay 365 uh, days a year. They're about the size of a, a morning dove. Uh, and you'll a lot of times see them on telephone poles. Uh, another one that comes in for just a short period of time is a Northern Harrier. And again, these uh, uh, eat quite a few uh, uh, of the voles just during the winter months. Owls are uh, very good at eating, uh, eating the voles or the field mice, the great horned owl, the Eastern screech owl, barred owl, barn owl, and the short-eared owl. So just a few statistics. Uh, in Wisconsin, 95% of the short-eared owls diet was voles. In Ohio, 90% of the long-eared owls uh, diet was voles. So uh, you will be able to tell if you uh, set up a few perches or if you happen to see pellets on the ground, uh, what the owls do is they kind of upchuck the, uh, the uh, bones and the fur and they put that in a little pellet and you can see that laying on the ground. Just to give you an idea how many uh, they will eat. Now, for some reason, this is a strange statistic, but they did voles consumed per acre per family. And the one that wins uh, is the American kestrel. That's why we're promoting uh, putting out some of these birdhouses. 
Uh, they are somewhat endangered. So uh, if you can get them to nest in an area, that's great. Uh, the red fox lead about 2.9 bulls per acre and the coyote about 0.7. And I have some more statistics on that. I'll show you a little bit more what's going on. But here's that birdhouse. Uh, if you want to uh, build one of these, uh, I've got the plans for them and uh, you can put them out. I have about two out on a couple of my fields. Uh, not sure if I have anything in them yet, but uh, they, they do help. And here's some of the statistics. Uh, these artificial perches and the birdhouses are very helpful. You can actually make a uh, perch should be about 10 foot tall, make it out of iron uh, steel post and just uh, weld a uh, one foot bar on that. They found 11 fold increase in uh, predation when, when they use the bars. The pestrels uh, use the perches in Texas and they saw anywhere from a, a three to 30 time increase in, in breeding pairs. So uh, these are very helpful to uh, help them see uh, the bulls and uh, spend less energy just flying around. Uh, you do have to be aware of the deer. The deer like to knock them over. So I would suggest that you uh, color them a bright color, you know, paint them orange. And uh, you might even want to make a map or GPS where they're at, because if they get knocked down and get in the vegetation, you don't want to run them through your equipment. But OK, so when you're uh, building one of these uh, uh, post, uh, what you want to use is a, about a 10 foot uh, fence post. They kind of act like den trees and you want to weld about a, a one foot bar across there. And uh, the one thing you do want to do though is, is be careful with the deer. The deer like to scratch on them and they'll knock them down. So I highly recommend that you plant, uh, you paint them a, a very bright color, maybe an orange. One thing you don't want to do is uh, to run that through your equipment. You might even uh, keep a map or GPS uh, of where you've got these. But when you have a lot of bulls, uh, you can set these out in the middle of a, of a big colony. And uh, you will be able to tell after a while that the hawks and the uh, owls will be working on them. So uh, that, that should help. Here's a, uh, another picture of uh, some of the foxes and uh, coyotes and how much they eat. You know, family of fox can eat 2.9 voles or 10 to 15 voles per day, whereas a family of coy coyotes will eat 10 to 20 voles per day uh, or about 0.7 voles per acre. You just got to remember that the coyotes are very free ranging. They have a very large territory. It's a lot better to have uh, some fox in the area than it is to have uh, the, the coyotes. Uh, feral cats, they're not all that reliable. Um, they eat a lot of beneficial songbirds and also some of the uh, insect pests and, and the weeds. So we don't really like to uh, uh, rely on them, but dogs are very good. Uh, these are the top 10 dog breeds for catching bulls and rats. Uh, I talked to a gentleman in Michigan. Uh, he had uh, three rat terriers and he was able to uh, uh, get about 250 voles in a two hour period. One of the ways he increased his success is he would take a shovel and uh, he would just lightly dig in the soil right where the, uh, the active burrows were. And when the voles would flee, the, the dogs would go right after them. And they don't eat them, they just kill them and uh, go on to the next one. So uh, dogs can be very beneficial. I will give you a word of warning. You probably don't want to make pets out of them. Uh, you probably don't want them licking your wife or your children's face. So, uh, or if you do, you better make sure they know that you're going on a vole hunt, okay? Uh, how do you manage voles? You want to focus on these couple things. First of all, focus on the food. Uh, plant crops that voles either dislike or use plants that you can use as a trap crop. Uh, shelter, you can alter the time that you plant. Uh, cover crops or the density and the height. Mowing and grazing are management strategies. You can also try to alter the moist, wet, cool conditions that voles and slugs love. So if you can do anything to alter those conditions, that will help. Promote predators wherever you can. We're going to talk a little bit more about the following cultural practices, uh, rotary hoeing, harrowing, zone tillage, chaff spreaders, row cleaners, graper heads, and, and of course, harvesting height. And, and we do have a couple chemicals, uh, trap baits and uh, repellents, things like that, that we can use 
Uh, although I will tell you that any one practice is only about uh, 60% effective. Here's a couple of things that you might try. Uh, first, use a good crop rotation and diverse species uh, to increase your predators. Uh, make sure that if you're gonna do a mixture, that at least one of the uh, cover crop species or a couple of them die out, that will allow the soil to dry up. And uh, also you'll have a little bit less uh, dense stand, so you'll have less cover. Drilling is always the best. Uh, aerial seeding, you're just gonna be feeding them uh, because they'll, they'll pick the seed right off the surface. And then you can always kill the cover crop about 30 days before planting. If you decide to plant green, you might try that as an option. Uh, uh, planting a little bit later in the growing season, the corn and the soybeans will grow a little faster and then you can kill the cover crop and uh, try to eliminate a food source before they get going. Here's a couple of things that uh, people have, have, are using. This is Ronco's uh, Volomatic. Uh, also drills do literally kill a few more voles just because they have a few more disc blades there that we're, we're just running them over basically uh, is what you're doing with these type of machines. Sometimes crimper rollers can be used. Uh, some folks are using the uh, row cleaners or zone tillage. They don't kill that many bowls, but they allow the corn and the beans to come up a little faster and they can outgrow uh, some of that uh, bowl damage. One thing that really works well is a row dairy hoe or a harrow. All you're doing is just fluffing that residue. If there's any nests on the surface or any fleeing bowls, uh, you, can, you can run a few of them down. The best time to use this machinery is in the uh, either in the spring or if you have a really bad problem in the fall and you want to do this uh, right after sunrise and right before sunset, uh, that's when the, the bowls may be the most active. You're going to uh, uh, spread your chaff, use a full width uh, chaff spreaders. They really help um, uh, give us less uh, place for the bowls to hide and uh, kind of spread that chaff out while also not allowed to be quite so wet. Another thing, uh, mowing uh, and burning really isn't uh, that, well, mowing is uh, beneficial, but burning really has variable results. Uh, usually the bowls will flee in front of the fire. The fire's pretty slow. And usually after the fire, uh, you, you get a lot of very lush weeds that the bowls really like. So they may migrate out for a couple of days and then maybe a couple of weeks later, they'll come back. So. Uh, burning really isn't that beneficial, and it also causes a lot of soil erosion. Uh, probably the most beneficial thing, again, is just killing the cover crop about 30 days for uh, uh, planting. We have tried a couple other things. This is some research from Purdue. Early, uh, they, they compared uh, just baiting them with uh, whole kernel corn and cracked corn. And if you have low populations, that might might work. I, I really not real hip on trying to uh, you know, feed the bulls. Uh, if you got a lot of bulls, you're just going to, um, you know, give them something good to eat. You can use the zinc uh, phosphide uh, pellets, uh, but uh, that's only for corn and it has to be put uh, in furrows. So uh, that, that does limit you. Uh, practices to control the bulls. Uh, there are some repellents uh, like Lohr's band uh, on corn can act as a repellent. Thyram can act, uh, uh, can be used in uh, beans and corn. The one thing you got to remember, though, is that bulls really love the soybean seed and the cotyledon. So that's what you're competing with. Uh, if they, some of these are smelly, but um, uh, if they can find it, uh, they'll they'll eat it. We do recommend planting your corn seed and beans uh, greater than two inches deep, and make sure you close that furrow because they just use that as a highway to to find the, the seed. And again, the phosphide pellets. They have to be put in furrow at about four to six pounds uh, per acre. There are a couple other uh, repellents farmers have used. Uh, capsin, uh, it's, it's uh, in hot peppers or, uh, and, and some people will even use cayenne pepper and put about two ounces of that in with the seed uh, to help reduce uh, bull feeding. It does mask the smell somewhat. I will tell you though, if you have a lot of bulls and they're hungry enough, they may get used to that hot taste and it may not be all that helpful. Uh, again, here's just uh, information on the, the pallets. It's a 2%, the pellets, it's a 2% zinc phosphide pellet. They're about an eighth of an inch long. It is a restricted use pesticide. 
you do have to put them in furrow. You need about four to six pounds per acre. It's called ProZap. Uh, a 50 pound bag will treat about 10 acres. And again, it's only labeled for corn. So here's kind of our summary. These are the things that bulls and slugs like. Um, and so you wanna to try to avoid both this. They both like wet, cool conditions. Um, if you plant your cover crops too early, it gives it a lot of vegetation. So they like that thick, dense vegetation. You might wanna keep your fence lines and buffers and ditches mowed down. Uh, they really like low to C, C to N ratio, something that's high in protein. No till, minimum till is where they, they uh, hang out. Although we do find them in tilled fields also. And they're going after the unharvested seed, corn, soybeans, and wheat. So do a good job of harvesting and you'll, you'll probably have less of them. Also weed seed, try to keep that down. If you broadcast your seed, that can be a problem. And if you got big piles of chaff, they'll hang out there. They really thrive under mild winters and wet springs. Uh, and they tend to follow open trenches. If you have an open trench, that's an indicator of, of wet conditions and poor growing conditions. So you might just wanna wait until you can get that trench closed before you go out there and plant your corn and beans. So they, they do well bowls under slow spring growth when it's cold and wet. They'll eat just about anything, grasses, legumes, and weeds. So, and then they, they really thrive where there's a lack of predators. Uh, some of the best management practices Probably the top one, according to Purdue, is to kill that cover crop 30 days before planting. You can mow it down less than eight inches, just check with NRCS. Um, if you're gonna plant your crops, plant them two inches deep, again, spreading the chaff. Um, control the weeds and, and mowing is very helpful. I, I've talked to a number of farmers that are using the rotary hoe and the harrow, and they're doing that in the spring and some are even doing it in the fall. It does kind of dry that out and uh, it, it will kill a few of the bulls. Uh, drilling the grain crops uh, can help get that seed below the, the, the uh, soil surface. That's uh, very beneficial or your cover crops. Drilling it is, is recommended. Drilling, uh, replanting soybeans isn't always effective unless you kill the, uh, the bulls because they'll just eat off those young cotyledons. So, uh, crimson clover might be an option. Uh, use a cover crop that will winter kill at least on 50%. And then if you're going to scout and monitoring, you want to do that at least 30 to 45 days before spring planting to see how big of a problem you have. The perches can help and the birdhouses. And then just try to select really good crops that grow fast. And if nothing else, uh, get yourself a dog and uh, try not to, to overhunt them. Last slide that I have is for baits and repellents. You can try the Lord's Band, the Thyram, uh, the Cayenne Pepper, uh, the, the Capsin. Um, you know, some of the best, uh, probably our best friends are some of these uh, common enemies, uh, enemies of the voles, the birds, the hawks, the fox, uh, and the, uh, the coyotes. And uh, you can try the baits. I will tell you the baits are pretty expensive zinc phosphide and you got some restrictions on that. I don't recommend the alternative feeding. I don't think anybody's gonna spend, uh, put, put out one to two bushel of whole soybeans at 10 to $11 a bushel or two to four bushels of the cracked corn. I just think you're asking for trouble. And I think really one of the best options is get yourself a rat terrier or a dog that can really help. So that's all I have for today. This is uh, how to control voles. This is Jim Horman with Horman Soil Health Services. Have a good day. The Ohio No-Till Council always gives scholarships. Uh, we started this with one, oh, six or eight years ago, and now we have a total of six altogether. Uh, and the first one of these that we'll uh, recognize today, and by the way, all, each of them will receive a plaque. This one has Chris Baird on it, but all of them will receive that in the mail. Uh, Chris Baird is from Clark County. He's receiving the Bill Richards Scholarship for $1,000. And we certainly appreciate Bill's contribution. Many of you know he's a long-term no-till farmer, gosh, uh, since the 1960s, and was also chief of NRCS. So he's providing this scholarship and one other one, the next one that you'll hear about. Well, Chris Baird, is a senior in agricultural systems management at Ohio State University. He's from Clark County. Oops. 
the Howard Doster Memorial Scholarship. Howard Doster was a professor, I believe, at Purdue. Yeah. And uh, he was a personal friend of Bill Richards, and so Bill is, is furnishing a memorial scholarship in his name. He goes to Reagan Dreger. She's from Sandusky County, and she's at OSU ATI and Sustainable Plant Systems. And the next scholarship is $500 going to Matthew Case. And Matthew's from Champaign County. Uh, he's at Worcester uh, at ATI, OSU ATI, studying agronomy. A $500 scholarship goes to Mackenzie Jolliffe. She's from Hardin County, which is where I'm from. Uh, her mother happens to be the ag teacher at Ridgemont here in Hardin County, and her dad's the ag teacher at North Union in Union County. She's at Wilmington College in Ag Ed. And the next one is Wyatt Kissel. Uh, he's from Knox County. Uh, he's at Ohio State University. Uh, studying, just like Chris, uh, agricultural systems management. I need to put a plug in. That bi if you don't know, that's in the Department of Food, Agriculture, and Biological Engineering, which uh, I retired from several years ago. So congratulations to Wyatt. The next one is for Danielle Shea Leeper. I think she's mostly known as Shea. She's from Union County, and she's at OSU in Ag Communications. And, and she's a senior there. So congratulations, and like I mentioned, all six of these will receive uh, a plaque. Next on the program, and our final speaker of the day, is Willie Durham, uh, and he's with NRCS in Texas. So since this is a virtual program, we're fortunate to have him uh, present to us. And he's talking about a topic that's uh, kind of deep, uh, nutrient cycling is a topic, but uh, talks about how roots capture micronutrients and helps their growth. Let's go to uh, Willie Durham. Hello everybody, this is Willie Durham. Um, I'm going to speak to you today about transitioning to a soil health management system. Uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I've earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Entomology and Master of Agriculture in, in degree in Agricultural Chemistry from Texas A&M. I've been a regional agronomist uh, for Novartis Seeds, states of Texas and Oklahoma and the Mexican state of Tamaulipas. And uh, I've also served with the NRCS uh, since 2002, uh, serving as a, a conservation agronomist, state conservation agronomist starting in 2008 up until 2014. Uh, and then I uh, became a regional soil health specialist and in part of the uh, USDA NRCS Soil Health Division. So I'm going to talk to you today about transitioning to a soil health management system and talk to you a little bit about soil health. Uh, soil health is the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains our plants, animals, and humans. And one of the things that we need to understand is that it, it's, it's all about soil function. And soil function has to do with the four ecosystem processes that are in every agro ecosystem. It's the carbon cycle, the bio community, which includes the soil food web, plants and animals, uh, the water cycle, we need water, we need infiltration and availability, uh, the nutrient cycle, we need those soluble and plant available nutrients to help grow our plants. And then in all, we also have to have the physical stability and support, okay, within that particular system. And then, we have to understand that it's also the habitat for the vast amount of uh, biodiversity that we have within those systems. So it's all about ecosystem function. And there's been a lot of unintended consequences uh, of cultivated soils. We've reduced our water infiltration, our storage, our, we've decreased biological activity because we grow monocultures, we follow the ground for you know six months out of the year possibly. And we've also decreased biological diversity uh, we do not have a very efficient nutrient cycling. Uh, we're having issues with that because of the loss of carbon and soil's ability to hold the particular nutrients, retain, retain and recycle. Uh, we also have uh, higher amounts on bare soils, but increasingly problems with the uh, summer temperatures being very high and we have problems with erosion. And then of course, the biggest, one of the biggest things that I'm gonna concentrate on today is that we have a reduction in aggregation uh, within the soil system. Uh, so all of these particular 
practices, the productivity of a conventional ag system, they're maintained by increased technology. You know, we, we're increasing the amounts of labor, fuel, nutrients, pesticides, water. These things are input driven systems. And so what we need to understand is, is that if we replace the degraded ecosystem processes, we're able to create a soil aggradation climb. Uh, we actually help uh, bring back the biological activity. We bring back the organic matter, the amount of turnover. Uh, we improve the nutrient cycling process. We improve the uh, structure. We improve the water availability. And then of course, we get a regeneration of these ecosystem processes and we reduce the, uh, the amounts of our inputs. So some of the things that we've added here recently uh, in our CS is that we've added new resource concerns and they include aggregate instability, okay? And we have to understand that that's a management induced degradation of, of water stable soil aggregates. And that results in destabilized soil carbon, soil crusting, surface crusting, reduced water infiltration, water holding capacity. Uh, it, it, we have problems with ponding and flooding uh, increases soil erosion, uh, we get plant stress more readily, uh, we reduce, literally reduce the habitat and soil uh, biological activity uh, because of how we farm and how we manage a lot of times. Uh, the other concern that we have is soil organism habitat loss. We've had a degrade, degradation of that. We don't have the proper soil biology in our soils, okay, uh, to help us enhance these ecosystem processes so that these plants uh, function as a vital living ecosystem. And so what we are going to do at NRCS, uh, USDA NRCS, is that we're going to follow these four core principles that help us to conserve and regenerate soil ecosystems. And they include minimizing disturbance, maximizing living cover, maximizing biodiversity and maximize continuous living roots in the ground to get carbon uh, into that system. And we're doing these particular soil health principles to support high functioning soils. Uh, we, we tend to protect the biology in the soil. Okay, we wanna protect those soil aggregates, the organism habitat. And then along with that, we want to feed the soil biology. We want to improve the resilience and improve the amount of soil organic matter that's starting to recycle, helping us to retain and recycle nutrients within that particular system. So we want to support that high functioning soil through these soil health principles. And one of the things we want to do is we transition to a soil, these uh, particular soil systems, soil health management systems, is that we want to get away from just the inherent properties, such as texture or clay or depth of bedrock, and we want to focus on the management dependent properties. These are the things that we can change. Organic matter content, biological activity, aggregate stability, infiltration, soil fertility, and soil reaction pH. So as we're doing that, we're creating all these spheres of influence. And this is where the microorganisms live, okay? Because 90% of soil function is mediated by the biology. So we're creating all these biological hotspots. Uh, in these particular systems where we're doing no-till and we're doing cover crops, we're leaving residues on top of the soil surface, we're actually creating these biological hotspots where these organisms live. We create more of a litter layer. Uh, we create uh, earthworm and, and root channels. Uh, we get more aggregation, uh, sustained aggregation in the soil system. We create more pore spaces, more pore sphere, more good air, water, gas exchange uh, within the soil system. And then of course, we, we also uh, enhance the rhizosphere. We enhance the association of plant roots with biology within the soil. And all of these particular areas of influence result in biological activities through ecological succession as you start to do these particular uh, things uh, within your cropping systems. And we have to understand that when we do no-till and cover crops, we add that to our management we get this biological succession and we get an ever increasing complexity of microorganisms and things coming into that system. And that leads to more available forms of nutrients, okay? Because of the particular biology that's there, we get more fungal complexity that increases with time, especially as we do no-till and cover crops. And then of course, we're, we're getting more balance between uh, say for nitrogen, as an example, we get more balance between nitrate and ammonium. And then we also get a uh, more microbial metabolites, more organic uh, 
uh, forms of nutrients start to come into play uh, with all this. And particularly, we get a balance of biology because of the systems that you're in right now, <clears throat> because of the tillage and the amount of fallow that we do and the monoculture rotation, uh, our systems are primarily, our agro-systems are currently in a bacterially dominated state. This is uh, things that support uh, uh, weeds and, and that's simply because of the high amounts of nitrate that we have, lack of oxygen, compaction, you're creating an actual niche uh, for those particular problems uh, to be there. And what we wanna do is we wanna transition that particular soil system to where there's more balance between uh, fungi and bacteria, more of a one-to-one -one balance, okay? Because that's what fits your row crop uh, system that you have. That's where we need to be. We need to have more of this fungal complexity. I'm gonna explain the importance of that. And we wanna understand that it's all about the regeneration and that involves this kind of controlled disturbance, okay? We don't, we don't want the disturbance. We don't, don't want the tillage. Uh, we want to reduce that. We want to get live living roots in the ground. We want to follow the soil health uh, core principles. So we have to understand that the most important is to understand that plants put root exudates into the soil. So when we start out with that compacted, that bare, fallow type of uh, soil system, one of the things that's vastly important is the enhancement of soil aggregation. And when we get those root exudates into that soil, this is the only thing that can start the process of what we call flocculation. Uh, what you see here is uh, all the dark areas or the clay platelets that are in that soil system. These polysaccharides, once they get exuded into this system, they're the only thing that can get into the little nooks and crannies. But one of the things that creates the polysaccharides or the root exudates create is they create flocculation. They allow the clay platelets or whatever to clump up Okay, when that happens, you create space. And that's a good thing. So we're, we're starting to create an aggregated uh, soil uh, condition, which allows for the biology to come in and gives the space or habitat uh, for the biology to uh, occur, okay, or to happen. And so along with that, I'm gonna show you, as you create those little areas of space, one of the key things is to get mycorrhizal association uh, because if you see here, this is a root hair uh, that has a vast amount of, uh, of mycorrhizal fungi inoculation on it. And what you see here is, is that the mycorrhizal fungi, the hyphae are about 1 25th the size of a human hair. They can also grow at a rate of 40 micrometers uh, per hour, okay? Uh, and one of the key things here is, is that you see how large that root is compared to the mycorrhizal hyphae. So you can have a lot of these particular mycorrhizal hyphae uh, inoculating or infecting that root, probably one for every millimeter, okay, that's around that circumference, okay. And from that one inoculation, you can have over 128 hypo tips going out into the soil system uh, itself. And, and that's important because those mycorrhizal filaments are accessing nutrients and water for you. So you have to think of these, in, these inoculation sites and stuff as water inlets and nutrient inlets uh, into the plant. They're helping uh, expand the root system uh, tremendously. Another curious thing about uh, mycorrhizal fungi is that fungi are the major holders of calcium, okay, uh, within the soil system. That's very important uh, because we have to have a, a calcium to magnesium ratio of seven to one, okay. Uh, calcium literally opens the soil up, uh, magnesium closes it back down, okay? So we have to have a ratio of at least seven to one, if not better, uh, as far as calcium and magnesium ratios are concerned. And, and the uh, fungi assist us in doing that. And that's what you see here. You see calcium uh, crystals uh, retained on the fungal hyphae uh, of these uh, fungi, okay? Along with that, as we're building this soil system, we start to get protozoa and things working for us. They, they're searching for bacteria and other things to consume. They move soil particles around. Uh, we get more and more aggregation, which allows more of our larger organisms to come in like nematodes. Nematodes also search for bacteria and fungi. Uh, they also consume other types of nematodes and keep the populations and stuff in check. 
And as we create that aggregated soil, we get this root gliding uh, effortlessly through the soil. I have to show you this because this is where we're starting to increase or enhance the nutrient and water holding capacity of the soil, okay? So just know we have to have this aggregation to get all this biodiversity and stuff working towards what we consider to be a fully functioning soil. Uh, one of the things that you can do is that you can use infiltration rings, and this is just a demonstration. Uh, the formula to figure out how many inches per hour infiltrate is up here at the top, one over W times 60. W represents the infiltration time, and that will give you inches per hour. Uh, it's important to watch and, and understand that you're getting better infiltration within your soil systems. And the reason for that is, uh, of course, uh, what we want to do is we want to understand the importance of water, okay, that we have to have these rain-fed systems. Uh, acre inch of water is 27,154 gallons, and I'm just going to give you an example here. been working with people here in South Texas, a man by the name of Zach Yonta, and one of the things is his infiltration rate, we've got it now to where it's upwards of around 2.65 inches per hour of infiltration. His neighbor that's right across the road uh, happens to have, we did infiltration rates there, and he had a half inch per hour infiltration. So when you talk about acre inches, you know, refer to these things as uh, more as gallons per acre, of water per acre, because it, it kind of emphasizes this. Farmers don't really understand when you say, well, a half inch versus two and a half inches, you know, they kind of think, well, that's not all that much. Well, it, it is a lot when 27,154 gallons equal an acre inch, okay? So I'm emphasizing this because these are rain-fed systems and we have to understand what happens with each rainfall event. If you have a soil system that can only infiltrate a half inch per hour, okay, then, and you have a one and a half inch rain, okay, within that hour, uh, you're not gonna infiltrate the full amount or the 40,731 gallons of rainfall, okay? Whereas you see in this example, since uh, Zach Yonta had 2.65 inches of infiltration, or was able to take in 71,958 of a two and a half inch rain, when he got this one and a half inches, it all went into the soil, okay? So it's, it's, we're talking about efficiency and trying to enhance the infiltration rates, very important. Okay, moving on, we have to understand the importance of plant root exudates uh, and organic matter to soil generation. And one of the things we want to focus on is understand that the, the production of these rhizosheets, that these root exudates get put out, and they feed biology within the soil system. And this helps us create more and more aggregation as these roots grow through the soil system, okay? And when we're building organic matter, here's something that's kind of new that has come about. You know, we've always thought that the uh, building of organic matter had to do with a biomass that was above ground. Well, now we understand uh, that it's about the photosynthesis and plant root exudates that are now recognized as constituting the primary pathway for soil building. See, there's two metabolic processes occurring in the carbon cycle. One is a decomposition pathway, which happens to be a catabolic process, okay, in which things are decomposed and you lose most of your carbon as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Okay, that's what's happening on the above ground surface, okay. But these plants, they photosynthesize and they put root exudates into the soil and they associate with certain forms of like mycorrhizal fungi. They so and, and mycorrhizal fungi associate with things like free fixing nitrogen bacteria. They just also associate with things like uh, phosphorus solubilizing bacteria to help acquire those particular nutrients. All in all, they, they create a more of a anabolic process that you see here. Uh, in which they are building humic substances within the soil system, okay? So when you talk about bacterial digestion, these systems that are, that are bacterially dominated, uh, we have to understand that you are getting mineralization, you are getting the availability of nutrients and things like that, you know, from the decomposition of the previous plant residues and stuff. But it, again, it's a catabolic process. You lose carbon as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, okay? Uh, as we transition this system, we start to get more fungal complexity. You start to have more trichoderma come in. These are the stubble digesting fungi, and they have the ability to do that because they produce cellulase. 
but the other interesting thing about trichoderma is that they are also able to produce chitinase, which means they can digest other fungi, which you see here, the uh, light uh, blue, dark blue lines are trichoderma, and the other uh, uh, wider hypi is the pathogenic fungi, uh, but these particular trichoderma are digesting that uh, pathogenic fungi that you see there. Uh, since they can also produce that chitinase, uh, they're also predatory. Uh, they're, they're predatory fungi. They not only consume other fungi in the soil system, but they also uh, consume nematodes, okay, within that system. So they're very beneficial, and these are things that are happening as you're transitioning this system uh, to more to a no-till and cover cropping uh, system, okay. Now, when we get to the fungi, when we start understanding that we start to get mycorrhizal fungi that have association with associative uh, diazotropes, things that fix nitrogen out of the, you know, out of the atmosphere, but all these things are in the soil system. Uh, you have to understand that these mycorrhizae associate with phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. They associate with prefixing nitrogen bacteria. It's a humification process and we build anabolic, uh, uh, we build soil organic matter, okay? It's an anabolic process. It's not just a decomposition process where we're decomposing everything and losing carbon to the atmosphere. We're actually producing humus uh, within that particular system. And mycorrhizae also, uh, we have to understand that, that when we have mycorrhizae, we get this humification process. You know, we have photosynthesis, they produce glucose, fructose, it's converted into sucrose, and then it's converted into hexose by the plant before it's fed to the mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae use that hexose and they combine it with microbial nitrogen uh, in, the, in the soil, okay, or this is in the mycorrhizae itself, to produce a, what is considered to be a glycoprotein. These are lipids, okay? And the fungi produces that uh, in the soil system. And this, it coats its hyphae and stuff, and since it's in the vast extension of this root system, like what you see here, okay? Uh, you understand that you get this uh, extra radical network outside of the roots. So when these things, particular things, slough off in the soil, you're left with this more stable glycoprotein or glomalin, as some people call it, uh, in that particular soil system. And that's very important to understand because there's, there's differences that are going on there. You need to have the microbes to convert the root exudates, okay, uh, that are normally chain carbon compounds they converted them into more into humus or more aromatic carbon hexagonal uh, type of carbon. And, and it, all this is just simply harder to break down. So you get more stable carbon uh, in that soil system, okay, that lasts. And so we also understand that mycorrhizae help us uh, with phosphorus availability. They're an extension of the root system. So they're able to go beyond root depletion zones. They help us with organic nitrogen uptake. Uh, we do know now that uh, these mycorrhizae pick up amino acids, vast amounts of amino acids, and carry them directly to the plant, uh, which is more energy efficient. Uh, we also understand that uh, as uh, soil pores next to roots become dry, as plants take up water, uh, the mycorrhizal hyphae can create bridges across those pore spaces, and the hyphae conduct water and immobile nutrients to roots despite the disruption of capillary water flow. So they're able to gain water and nutrients you know, under dry conditions that, that the plant cannot do uh, on its own. Also, they assist us with water management. When moisture becomes limiting, a dry period of uh, mycorrhizal uh, plant utilizes water that's actually stored in what are called uh, root cell uh, vesicles, okay, that are formed. Not all mycorrhizae form that, but a good number do. So they store water and nutrients within the plant root. And that helps us out. Uh, you also get an increase in micronutrients and, and nutrients overall. Uh, in this particular picture, you see where you've had mycorrhizal wheat cover, you get maturity much quicker because of the amount of nutrients and stuff that are there and available. Whereas where you had a fallow period or a fallow area here with no mycorrhizae, you see how the, you don't have the maturity there going on. And then over here on the left, uh, same issue, canola is not mycorrhizal and the soybeans are, you see the differences in growth and maturity, okay? Uh, other issue is, and this is from Dr. Christine Jones, uh, as we build these types of systems, uh, you'll start to notice that you get a darker color 
uh, within the soil system. That's an indicator that you're getting more carbon, uh, more or less sequestered within that particular soil. Okay, so that left profile that you see there, that's a paddock with ground cover that's been actively managed and cropped and grazed to enhance photosynthetic capacity to feed the biology. Okay, whereas the, on the right side, that's a conventionally managed neighboring paddock that has been set stocked and has a long history of phosphate uh, fertilizer application. So you see how it's lost carbon within that system. I'm showing you this because one of the vast differences is, is that the, the soil that's on the left side there that was managed for photosynthesis uh, is over 200% more, has over 200% more organic carbon. And, and it also holds over 200% more water and it also has a, a vast amount of calcium uh, within that system, which is something that's vitally needed uh, within our system, okay? We also see a pH change of 5.2, it's now more closer to neutral. So this is what we're trying to get when we establish a, a soil health system. And then of course, we have a vast availability of nutrients that become available Okay, now between these two systems as we start to work on these soil ecosystem processes of the soil. Now, one of the key things, you know, when we talk about ecological and biological management is that when you're building things like humic substances in the soil, uh, I'm just gonna give you an example of how you build biofertility. Uh, humic, this is a common humic molecule. These humic molecules have hydroxyl and carboxyl groups on them in the soil solution. These hydrogens that you see here uh, are, are sloughed off and you get a negative two charge. And that's what allows the soil system to grab onto or more or less chelate and grab onto things like manganese, copper, iron, zinc, uh, calcium, and magnesium. Now, the other key thing is we increase the cation exchange capacity because we're managing the soil in this manner. Uh, we also have to understand that the anion capa uh, exchange capacity is 25% of the cation exchange capacity. So in, all in all, it's helping us to retain both cations and the anions uh, within this particular soil system. So it, it's building the soil fertility levels by building soil organic matter and humic substances uh, within the soil. Here's an example from Gabe Brown. Uh, we we're talking about uh, grazing uh, cover crops in this particular situation. I use this in a grazing module uh, that we teach uh, about soil health. But this gives you a different idea of the management that's going on and how that influences MPK and water tract organic carbon, which is the food source for the biology, organic matter, and, and infiltration. But farm number one is a cash grain, tillage, cover crops, no synthetics, no livestock, minimum uh, farm two is minimum tillage, two crops, modern synthetics, no livestock. Farm three is medium diversity, no till, high synthetics, no livestock. Farm four is Gabe Browns. He has high diversity, no till, cover crops. One herbicide uh, at the time that we did this uh, evaluation, and he's still using livestock, using livestock to harvest cover crops, okay, to a point. So what I want you to notice is look at the vast differences in the amount of NP and K in Gabe Brown's farm number four. He has over 281 pounds per acre of nitrogen, 1,000 pounds of phosphorus available, 1,749 pounds per acre of potassium. But look at the amount of water extracted organic carbon. It's almost uh, four to five times the amount of the other systems, which is telling you that his system is way more biologically active. Uh, over the years, he has now built his organic matter content up to 6.9%. And then one of the biggest benefits is his infiltration rate and porosity and aggregation in the soil. He gets up to 30 inches per hour of infiltration. So that's just a tremendous uh, benefit of following soil health principles. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to leave you with some things. Of, Jim wanted me to talk to you about some of the new things that have happened uh, that we're learning more and more about. And this is from Dr. James White, uh, uh, Rutgers University, uh, but it's called the rhizophagy cycle. I don't know if many of you have heard about that, but it's an oxidative process in plants uh, for nutrient extraction from symbiotic microbes. All those microbes that were growing around that particular root system are actually be able to be picked up uh, by 
the plant root, okay? Uh, the microbes enter the uh, root cell and then in spaces carrying nutrients from the soil and then the uh, nutrients are extracted from those particular microbes, okay? And it's a reactive oxygen uh, process, oxidative process in which they extract those particular minerals or nutrients and then those microbes are uh, exit back out through the root hairs, exhausted of their nutrients, and then they perform their function of, of acquiring nutrients again all over, okay, all over again. So this particular system is called a rhizophagy cycle. We're now understanding that lots of plants have the ability to do this, okay? So this is important, building those rhizosheets and things that we have within that soil system. And we also have to understand the importance of biodiversity because uh, bacteria on fungal highway, uh, this is just an example uh, that I, we have here. Uh, these are uh, Pseudomonas uh, petita bacteria that are moving up and down along the mycorrhizal hyphae. Okay, you can see them moving up and down. And I'll discuss, you know, just here, the, it's important to understand what's going on here because a lot of these particular forms of biology could actually be nitrogen fixers, okay? Uh, if the soil is biologically diverse, these processes create an upward epigenetic, epigenetic spiral. Uh, in chemically managed soils, you don't have these type of things occurring, okay? The host system goes the other way around. It doesn't support biology. So when plants are growing in diverse communities, they're able to source microbes, not only from their own microbiome, but also from the microbiome of neighboring plants. Okay, because these mycorrhizae associate with different plants from one to the other. This provides access to a much wider range of genetic material. It helps you to alleviate biotic stresses and, and such things as nutrient deficiencies, or maybe you have plant or disease pressure uh, that you need help on. But that allows these particular biology and things like that to assist you and to grow in populations to help. Okay. They can even help you uh, concerning uh, frost and drought and salinity uh, within your system. Okay, so it's very important. This is very something that's real interesting and we need to understand. Also, Jim wanted me to talk to you about glyphosate impacts. Uh, one of the key things here is just to understand that glyphosate is, is toxic. I know a lot of you grow uh, Roundup Ready soybeans and corn. Here in Texas, we grow uh, Roundup Ready cotton, uh, which we're using uh, glyphosate four to five times on. Understand that that particular uh, glyphosate is exuded through the root system, okay? It ties up minerals and things within the soil. It's toxic uh, to things like Pseudomonas uh, species of biology. Those Pseudomonas uh, bacteria that are in the soil help us to reduce manganese and iron. Manganese is needed for water hydrolysis or for the uh, plant's ability to convert uh, uh, sucrose, or excuse me, glucose and fructose into sucrose, okay? It allows the plant to store uh, more complex sugars. So you have to have manganese uh, in this particular situation in order to do that. And it has to be in the right form, it has to be in a reduced form, which means it has to have a two uh, plus valent charge. So if you have uh, oxidized types of manganese within the soil system, Okay, that means that the manganese is tied up and it's in the wrong form. So when you kill these pseudomonas, you have oxidizing forms of, of other uh, pathogenic, particularly fusarium, uh, that come in and replace the pseudomonas. And fusarium are oxidizers, okay? So they oxidize manganese, iron, and also nitrogen. You know, you have nitrogen uh, whenever you have uh, ammonium, uh, uh, put out into the soil system. Uh, it's rapidly converted into nitrate by nitrifying bacteria. Okay, so the, those are all forms of nutrient oxidizers, and that can be detrimental in some cases, especially with, with uh, manganese and iron, and also it can be a problem if you have a lot of nitrate uh, that's being picked up by the plant. If you don't have adequate uh, molybdenum to help you convert the uh, nitrate into an amino acid, Okay, it's very important to have molybdenum in order for the nitrate reductase uh, enzyme to be there for that to happen. So that's some of the things that we need to be aware of. Uh, glyphosate, you need to pay attention to that. I know y'all grow uh, soybeans in your area 
this is just an example right here, increased severity of root rot after glyphosate application, Roundup Ready soybeans uh, on your uh, non-inoculated control on the left, inoculated plants in the center, and then the inoculated plants that were sprayed with glyphosate on the right, and you can see how the root rot's coming in. Here's another example uh, on wheat, uh, where they uh, literally, uh, wheat was grown following Roundup Ready soybeans sprayed with glyphosate, that's over here on the left. Uh, and, and then following the Roundup Ready beans grown with non-glyphosate herbicide on the right. So you see a lot of differences and understand how uh, glyphosate can increase uh, that problem. Uh, fertilizer impact, just know that fertilizer inhibits uh, free fixing nitrogen bacteria in the soil. It also inhibits uh, uh, your mycorrhizal fungal application. This is just an example. The fertilizer was put in a band below the seed. You see how the plants associate here on top. And then once they hit the fertilizer bland, uh, band, they're uh, clean and white. Same thing here uh, on the left, there's no fertilizer. You see the rice sheaths forming. We're getting those biological associations. On the right, you don't have that. Fertilizer is applied, roots are white and clean. There's no root exudates or association with biology. So we wanna get these root exudates, these rhizosheaths, uh, these uh, root exudates associating with biology and get these rhizosheaths going uh, within the soil system. There are ways to make your fertilizers more biologically and ecologically friendly. Uh, you can come in and, and understand about, uh, you know, when you apply inorganic nitrogen, uh, only about uh, 33 to 55% of it is actually picked up by the plant, okay? So we have to understand where the rest of that nitrogen comes from uh, within the system. And it literally, what, it, what happens is it comes from the biology and through the biology. So it's very important to understand these principles. And so we need to do things to help us. When we use inorganic fertilizers, one of the key things to do is to stabilize the nitrogen. We want to complex or, or chelate the particular fertilizer, depending on what it is, quickly convert it to an amino acid, and that happens through bacterial mineralization. So we want the bacteria to help us uh, with this added nitrogen that goes into the system, and then it becomes available to the plant later. Bacteria need soluble carbon, sulfur, molybdenum, okay? Here's a common example. We wanna use, uh, possibly change from using straight nitrate, things like this, uh, to ammonium thiosulfate, where we get proper uh, uh, amounts of uh, nitrogen to sulfur. Uh, within the system, we're finding areas that are deficient in sulfur, so we don't have enough sulfur to go with the nitrogen that we, uh, that we have. Uh, you have to have that uh, micronized linardite or humic acid you can use it up to upwards of 3% of the nitrogen solution to help you stabilize the nitrogen so that it's not leached or lost uh, within the system. We want to add molybdenum to help the conversion of nitrate, okay, into an amino acid as quickly as possible. And then we want to add molasses at 5% solution. Very effective at holding all nitrogen. Uh, uh, this practice is very effective at holding all nitrogen. The trade-off is to reduce nitrogen by 30% supports bacteria as they do their job. So it just makes things more biologically friendly. Uh, you should do this, okay? Uh, phosphorus and mycorrhizal fungi, inorganic phosphorus inhibits mycorrhizal fungi and phosphorus solubilizing bacteria. Plants sense phosphate and they stop sending sugars and exudates uh, into the soil. And that's a, uh, literally what happens, they, it inhibits trigolactone production and that's a root growth hormone and that also allows the mycorrhizal fungi to associate with the plant root. And then, of course, we want to use micronized uh, lenardite or humic materials or whatever to complex with the, uh, the anions and things that are in the soil. That's something else that we can focus on. Uh, we're also understanding now that we can also micronize phosphorus and calcium, uh, make them already available uh, to plants. So there's a lot of key things that we can do uh, to regenerate an optimal system when it comes to this. And we just need to reduce the quantity of applied fertilizer per application, make it more biologically friendly, buffer and stabilize that fertilizer. Okay, And then we need to add, uh, if we can, from a phosphorus perspective, add phosphorus solubilizing microbes and biostimulants uh, to your soil system to assist in all this. And all of it's just to benefit improving soil health, uh, paying attention to those dynamic uh, properties that we can influence, such as increasing water soluble organic carbon that's feeding the biology, creating more aggregation and infiltration, 
enhancing water and nutrient holding capacities of the soil, increasing the soil biological habitat, and then that leads to productivity increase. But it happens over biological time. Okay. So agronomic efficiencies are optimized when soil health is maximized. Uh, managing for a living ecosystem is key to this optimum production system. We can take production and conservation further with management systems that continually build soil health, use cover crops, use no-till, use good crop rotation, and, and learn to capture the potential. Okay, so all I have for you, just know that management affects soil function and use a little bit of ingenuity. Thank you. Have a good day.